Alleluia. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Greetings, Bethlehem Lutheran Church. Uh, as we gather on this fourth Sunday of Easter, I thought it might be appropriate, given the bucolic imagery uh, in our lessons on this Good Shepherd Sunday, to take us out of the sanctuary and into uh, this space, our Wilcox property. Uh, to my right here, I'm seeing uh, the gardens that some of you have been working on just this week. I'm going to invite you to bow your heads with me as we begin in prayer. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Gracious Father, we thank you for being the gate of your sheep, the way, the truth, and the life. We adore you because you hear us, and through you we are saved. We acknowledge that the thief comes to steal and to kill and to destroy, but Lord, you have come so that we may have life and have it more abundantly. Thank you for being the good shepherd of our souls who leads us on into eternal life. Thank you for being the Lamb of God who laid down your life for the sheep. We acknowledge, O oh Lord, that you care deeply for your own. We give you thanks that you have called and gathered us into your fold. Help us always to hear your voice and to follow you. We ask these things in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the good will of all the people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. The second reading is from 1 Peter. For it is a credit to you if being aware of God, you endure pain while suffering unjustly. If you endure when you are beaten for doing wrong, what credit is that? But if you endure when you do right and suffer for it, you have God's approval. For to do this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example, so that you should follow in his steps. 
he committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. When he was abused, he did not return abuse. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but he entrusted himself to the one who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that free from sins, we might live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. For you were going astray like sheep, but now you have returned to the shepherd and guardian of your souls. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. And I will trust in you. I shall not want. He maketh me lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup run my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all of the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This is the Gospel of our Lord according to St. John, the 10th chapter, beginning in the first verse. Very truly, I tell you, anyone who does not enter the sheepfold by the gate, but climbs in by another way, is a thief and a bandit. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him and the sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he has brought out all of his own, he goes ahead of them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. They will not follow a stranger, but they will run from him because they do not know the voice of a stranger. Jesus used this figure of speech with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So again, Jesus said to them, Very truly, I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and bandits, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters by me will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. 
The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. and peace to you from God our Father, Christ Jesus our Lord, and the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. The fourth Sunday of Easter is often called Good Shepherd Sunday, and something you need to know about your pastors is that when I was a little boy, I had dozens of stuffed animals, maybe scores, uh, but among my favorites were Lammy and Big Lammy. And on that note, before we open up the gospel lesson for today, I want to share a reading from a book that I wrote as a child based on a dream that I had during nap time. Uh, this is called Matthew's book, and it was published in Shapley, Maine in 1984. I saw Jesus with his lammy. He said, would you like to hold my lammy? He gave me his lammy. Then I said to him, would you like to hold my lammy? 
I gave him my Lammy. The end. What I find most remarkable about this children's book is not its plot or illustrations, but that it reminds me of the earliest image I had of our Lord was of a shepherd. And this storybook recounts the dream of a three-year-old, yet I recognize in it the same Lord who said, let the little children come unto me. The same Lord who received five loaves and two fish from a little boy and with that poultry meal fed a multitude. All of this is background to this dream wherein I offer the good shepherd the thing I prize most. A worn out lammy hemorrhaging stuffing from its seams and Jesus takes it without any hesitation and exchanges it for the real thing. Now think back to childhood for a moment when you were a little kid. The world in many ways is the Wild West at that time. Every play partner is a potential threat, a robber. Every toy swap is a risk. Do you really trust your trade partner to follow through? Will you still like what you got once you get it? None of that childhood anxiety, though, enters into this dream. Instead, there is perfect trust, the faith of a child. And we can psychologize this dream away if we want. Maybe I fell asleep looking at the precious moments figurine on the nightstand, that cherub-faced shepherd with a first aid kit kneeling to bandage the leg of his wounded lamb. But whatever the many material causes for this childhood dream, there is something profound about this primal Christ image because it reflects a larger truth within our Christian tradition. See, I think we forget sometimes that long before the cross entered the iconography of the church, long before we were building cathedrals to Christ the Pentocrator, the king of the universe, Christians were painting murals in the catacombs of Rome. And what do we find on the catacomb walls? We find repeating images of a clean-shaven youth flanked by his flock, a single lamb draped over his shoulders. The oldest extant Christian art is of Jesus, the Good Shepherd. Now, all our lessons treat of this theme, but John's gospel gives us perhaps the richest images. God as shepherd and gatekeeper and gate all in one. They all function as aspects of this divine shepherding role, but they're worth thinking about independently. Take the concept of shepherd. We hear that word in a Christian context, and sometimes our imaginations travel to an overtly sentimental place, maybe the images of our youth, the cuddly lambs, the kindly shepherd, the pastoral disposition, the bucolic scenery. But John's gospel is not just some primary color cartoon. In it, Jesus warns us about thieves and bandits and strangers who prey upon the faithful and scatter the flock. The good shepherd is one who opposes these things by interposing his body, his blood between these threats and the ones threatened. This shepherd is the one who gives up his own life. For his sheep. Or take that word gatekeeper. In this digital age, we imagine faceless bureaucrats who stamp documents and source our news and manage the flow of information behind closed doors. Just spend an hour on hold, check the IRS database for your stimulus update, file for unemployment, fire off that email into the void. We all experience the anxiety of the modern age. A hundred people can contact you in a dozen different ways, but you can't make the one timely connection that you need. So I think we recoil from the idea of gatekeepers, those unseen, unaccountable knowledge workers armed with the esoteric arts of actuary tables and computer coding. These are not the kind of gatekeepers that Jesus has in mind. For Jesus, the gatekeeper is one who opens the gate. 
so that the shepherd may enter, gather his flock, and lead them out. The gatekeeper enables the shepherd to enter the fold, to enter the world of the sheep. And the gatekeeper also frees that flock, enabling them to follow the shepherd back out through that gate. A beautiful picture of the incarnation, which opens the way to eternal life. God became like us so that we might become like God. Now, when those sheep follow him through that gate, we hear that word, and I think, again, we imagine something negative. That word gate itself sounds like something that excludes, that limits, that holds back, or otherwise impinges on our freedom. That's not the kind of gate that God is. A good teacher doesn't let her students invent their own alphabet, develop their own phonic system, or create their own grammar, but rather she teaches them the parts of language so that they can read. And in doing this, she doesn't trap them in a set of rules, but rather she opens the world to them. The gate through which she leads them creates the very possibility for communication and creativity, inventiveness and improvisation. The wrong sorts of gates do close off, do lead to dead ends to be sure, but the right kind of gate can open up the future, can lead us out of ourselves into a larger world, a world of abundant life where true freedom and flourishing are made possible. So, too, the good golf coach doesn't leave you to your own devices, but teaches you a better golf swing. And the good parent doesn't suspend all rules, all expectations, but he creates boundaries appropriate to that child's stage of development. Because, as a counselor has reminded me often, the right kind of boundaries, the right kind of consistency brings clarity, creates safety, and invites serenity. But we must acknowledge that we live in a time where there is great distrust of institutions and deep skepticism about religion, some of it sadly warranted. Any fool can make a rule has become the byword in our time. Anything that sets itself up as an authority is challenged and attacked. How do you know? What gives you the right? That's just your truth. We live in an age that admits of only one ultimate truth, the truth that there is no truth, except the truth that there is no truth. In other words, the primal spiritual instinct is alive and well. It's not so much that we don't want a good shepherd, maybe, is that we don't believe such a one exists. And so we're left with our subjectivity, our autonomy, making our own law, choosing to shepherd ourselves. The church of the good shepherd, however, has never seen the world that way. Nor in its earliest days did it envision the kingdom of God as an alternative political arrangement to set athwart the kingdoms of this world. It has always been a political force, to be sure, but its instruments have been mercy and forgiveness. Its power is grace and humility, things not of our own choosing or our own making, but gifted to us by the Holy Spirit, the Spirit who calls and gathers and enlightens. My sheep hear my voice, the Good Shepherd declares, and they follow me. And I lock them in a pen? No. No, Jesus says, they follow me and I call each one by name and lead them out. See, the sheep pen doesn't make the flock, the shepherd does. The sheep are not constituted by the structures they inhabit any more than the church is to be identified with a place or a property. The sheep are the good shepherd's sheep because they hear his voice and they follow him. And so our Lord continues, whoever enters by me will be saved and they will come in and go out and find pasture. I love this image of movement, of coming in and going out. 
like we've been talking about in the movement of the liturgies. There is this back and forth flow. God speaks and we respond. The Spirit gathers, enlightens, and then dismisses us, sends us out as one body in many members on mission. So, of course, buildings matter. The Bible matters. Our theology matters. But they don't matter in themselves. They matter insofar as they bring us into right relationship, draw us into right praise of the shepherd of our souls. It's not ultimately about the grammar, but about the world that reading opens up and the kind of person that an encounter with words can create. The point of golf is not the rules themselves, but how learning them can lead us to play the game expertly and how learning to play the game of golf well uh, indeed influences other areas of our life where self-discipline and self-regulation and expert um, abilities can flourish. To be a follower of the Good Shepherd means admitting that we don't get to shepherd ourselves. And yes, each of us has those internal voices, some healthy and some unhealthy, that we can't help but listen to. But to grow in faith means subordinating all other voices, including our own, to his voice. Trusting our Lord and Savior to lead and to guide. In many ways, it comes back to that simple dream I had as a kid. In every season of life, we are called to entrust ourselves and our purposes to God. Maybe what we offer our Lord today is our doubt or our grief. Maybe it's our anger or bitterness or disappointment, our worry over our future or our children's future. I have to say, in my adult years, it's been far harder to let go and to entrust to God those things that I love most, my family my friendships, my vocations. Yet we know that following the Good Shepherd means trusting that when we give him our worn out lammies, leaking stuffing at the seams, he gives us back the real thing. Not just any old lamb, but the Lamb of God himself, who takes away the sins of the world, who comes that we might have life and have it to the fullest. Thanks be to God. Amen.
going to invite you to uh, recite with me the words of the Apostles' Creed. And I often think we think of this as a summary of our faith, and it certainly is that, a good lens through which to read Holy Scripture. But uh, the oldest tradition really sees the recitation of this in a public context as a prayer, a way in which we center ourselves and focus on God and give thanks to him through the words of this confession. So I invite you to make this a prayer uh, as we recite together the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us in our video worship this Sunday. I want to also thank those who are helping us singing and playing instruments for your worship experience. We have Sydney Foslin, Nicole Moss, Spencer Foslin on guitar, Cami Embacher on bass guitar, and the dude with the shades, Caleb Smith on drums. Our final song is He Has Made Me Glad. risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. And now may our risen Lord bless you and keep you. May our Lord make his face to shine on you, be gracious unto you, lift up his countenance upon you, and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Take four. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>